Hi there. So I'm continuing where I left in the previous chapter and talking about um, Kazakh mounted archers tactics. And we'll start with um, the description of the five weapons that I mentioned earlier as the five weapons martial arts system. So what are these five weapons? Uh, it's often mentioned in the uh, uh, in the in the oral tradition in the epics that uh, all warriors must master five weapons in order to be proficient and those weapons were uh, there are different classifications as to what constitutes uh, the five weapons I'm not gonna get into that here uh, basically uh, the most common interpretation is that uh, one weapon, the main weapon, is bow and arrow. The second one is uh, lance or spear. The third one would be, um, you know, uh, saber or sword. The third one would be probably battle axes. Uh, I mean, fourth one. And then... Uh, the fifth one would be blunt weapons or something. I uh, I use different kind of system based on uh, my own use of it. But I, like I said, I'm not going to go into this. That's a whole separate series uh, that we're talking about. Uh, a whole another playlist. But basically, this is the idea that any warrior going to war, any nomad would carry with him bow and arrow, spear, saber or sword, battle axe, uh, some kind of blunt weapon, and also uh, most likely a dagger or a hunting knife or something for close combat. There were also some specialty weapons, but that's the standard uh, set, standard kit. And of course, they all require different techniques, different approach and training and use. They have their pluses and minuses. Uh, also, cost uh, comes into consideration because some of them are cheaper, some of them are more expensive. But that's kind of, um, uh, that's kind of touching upon this subject. Uh, later on, uh, gunpowder kind of reached the steps and they started using matchlock rifles. Uh, and like I said, it didn't replace bow and arrow at all. Uh, the bow and arrow didn't even lose its relevancy. It's just that matchlock guns kind of extended a possibility of, an, of a horseback archer and they used them for certain tasks. But uh, the... the uh, the tactics overall remain the same, this, you know, massive showering with arrows and disappearing before the enemy could counterattack. That remained the same, pretty much. A few, few tactics uh, that Kazakhs used, uh, again, they were invented probably in Scythian soccer times and didn't change much. It was, you know, hit and run where they would... Uh, you know, uh, attack with arrows, probably switch to lances, uh, you know, charge and hit with lances, and then retreat if the enemy didn't run, if the men, if the enemy stood uh, ground, they would, you know, turn away and run and keep shooting backwards, uh, you know, the Parthian shot, inflicting damage this way. Uh, another tactic would be uh, the ambush when, you know, uh, part, uh, one party would attack the enemy and then retreat, a false retreat. The enemy would chase and the retreating party would lead them into an ambush where the second part would attack them from the rear or from the side and inflict heavy damages this way. Uh, another one that I mentioned is Tulgama, Tulgama, where they would just try to uh, go 
around the enemy flanks usually on the right showering arrows to their left side inflicting damage this way uh, destroying the order kind of uh, creating this mess and uh, trying even to get to the rear and maybe then switch to uh, lances or, or sabers and get into a melee fight and then retreat or something so it was it was very it was very flexible it was uh, the nomads were very hard enemy because they didn't fight fair by 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 the um, foot soldier by the infantry standards they would always try to inflict more damage to the infantry without uh, risking their lives as opposed to you know fa fighting face to face and the strongest man wins with the nomads it would be the swiftest the trickiest the cunniest wins and that was that was the honor of course it was different when the nomads fought each other because then none of these tricks would work they all use the same techniques and uh, very often instead of fighting each other when the forces were equal and uh, none of the sides could uh, expect to win easily sometimes they would decide the outcome of a battle via duel each side would put their uh, best uh, dueler best soldier best warrior and they would agree that uh, whoever loses his side would accept it as a defeat and leave and very often that's how they would decide the outcome of a battle instead of spilling their kin's blood and, and their own blood but against invading infantry or when they invaded uh, settled nations they used every single trick in the book to avoid uh, losses among themselves it wasn't it wasn't a big honor to die in the battle with infantry you know it was just it was considered very stupid and they tried to not do that and maybe that explains why small nomadic armies could defeat very large settled nations armies because they were just so careful about their losses they were trying to avoid they were trying to strike at the very best moment when the enemy's uh, you know uh, formations were stretched when they didn't expect using all kind of trickery and it was uh, for the nomads the this kind of victory would be the most honored because uh, if they could save their own people and inflict maximum damage to the enemy that's the honor not just you know face to face and you know uh, the strongest wins another one another tactic that they used was the uh, so-called carousel it's when uh, they would form this kind of ring kind of uh, it, it wasn't a ring it was more of an oval formation or kind of like uh, you know almost like a mm, stretched uh rectangle with rounded ends kind of formation along the enemy line and where they would uh, rotate in this shape path and uh, the side that passes the enemy would shoot arrows uh, to the to their left side so it was going uh clockwork and then they would uh, get a little rest or resupply on their on their way at the back of this shape of this oval and then they would do it again and you know it sounds very neat in theory uh, but there are descriptions that if their commanders were killed during this uh, maneuver uh, then it caused great commotion they lost their rank they lost their 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 order it turned into a chaos and you know the, the whole formation would just fall apart so it was very important 
to keep their commanders alive. And I can add my own two cents to that. Uh, this is the kind of exercise that we would always perform as part of our uh, presentation uh, before the visitors and tourists. And we would do four laps, sometimes even more. And I must say, uh, even though we did a very small oval, comparing to what they had to do i must say it's a hard work it's it's exhausting it sounds neat it sounds like you just you know you know just galloping and shooting and galloping and shooting you know what's the big deal but in reality it's very very exhausting after four rounds after four laps you know you kind of feel it it's it's it starts getting to you and if you had to do it uh, in a much larger oval, in a much larger carousel for many, many hours straight, that must be very, very exhausting. And again, uh, I have a tremendous respect to the conditioning they had to have in order to pull something like that. Because for me, it would be just too hard almost impossible to pull off yeah but they've done it and it was a standard uh, tactics for for millennia and that's uh, kind of briefly uh, what I wrote about the tactics obviously this subject um, re requires a lot more in-depth studies and reading but I just wanted to cover everything in one book without going too deep but at the same time leave you with kind of a well-rounded overall impression of what the Kazakh archery was uh, another interesting aspect worth mentioning here is the female Kazakh archers and uh, you know uh, recently I think it became universally accepted that the mythical Amazons were actually the Scythian or Saka uh, female warriors, female archers, horseback archers, that either acted as independent units or as, um, you know, uh, auxiliary light archer units uh, to support their, you know, husbands who were doing dirtier more dangerous work uh, i also came across theories that maybe when men went to war or, or raids uh, females would organize these patrols and kind of patrol around their areas uh, which is a duty usually performed by men the nomads had to patrol their territories because there are no walls and so in times when all men went to raid or war women would have to pick up the slack and perform these duties and that's where this myth maybe was born because somebody traveled there some persian or greek dude and they met this unit 100 percent women of different ages and they were just amazed fully equipped same equipment as their their husbands you know bows arrows lances swords you name it and they were just amazed and maybe that's how the myth was born so there are many many um theories there but one thing we know for sure uh, there is now undeniable historical evidence from all over the uh, eurasia that there are burials where they buried female warriors with their bows, armor, weapons. So we know now with 100% certainty that female warriors existed. And if that's the truth, that maybe uh, it is true that they formed separate units or something, had their own chain of command or whatnot, or maybe fought with their husbands together. Anyways, uh, 
I think I, I consider it pretty much confirmed by now. When I was younger, it was still speculated as a sort of theory. But by now, I think, yeah, it's it's pretty much it's a fact. Now, that's, of course, we're talking about uh, Saka, Scythian times, Sarmatians, and etc. Now, what about more recent times like uh, Kazakhanate, 15th century, 18th century, you know, 19th century? The Kazakhs, the Kazakhanate. And here we have uh, evidence uh, that this tradition survived these millennia and it still existed. Pretty much. During the Kazakh uh, Jungar Wars, uh, when we suffered heavy losses, it was a uh, kind of situation where two of the large surviving uh, nomadic hor hordes uh, had to fight each other for the shrinking resources. And so they were, we were invading them, they were invading us. And uh, looks like they were invading us more often and more successfully. So we suffered a lot. And during that period, uh, our men uh, suffered such huge losses that women really had to take weapons in their hands again, just like their Scythian, Amazonian you know, predecessors. And they had to fight along their men. Uh, they fought with them shoulder to shoulder. Um, they had they fought in separate units as auxiliary, as horseback archery, archers, light cavalry, and etc. Doing uh, raids, you know, kind of uh, disturbing enemy lines, and etc. And that's that's pretty much documented. There are even names that history saved. Uh, I kind of uh, mentioned a few in my book. So you can read about it. And uh, also it's interesting. I, I thought it is worth mentioning about Kazakh uh, heroes, female heroes of the World War II, because I thought this is the same lineage of female warriors from, uh, you know, uh, early Iron Age, uh, from maybe even late Bronze Age to, uh, you know, 20th century to World War II, where uh, Kazakh women fought in a very uh, difficult war, and they deserved the base, the best. Uh, recognition. One of them is Alia Maldagulova or Alia Maldagulova, if we say it in Kazakh. She was a sniper, uh, a hero, recognized. Uh, I put uh, her photograph in my book. And another one was uh, Manchuk Mametova or Manchuk. Manchuk Mametova, and she was machine gunner. She is also a hero. Uh, I put a brief uh, description of their uh, of, of what they did. Basically, one of them, as a sniper, was a, sh a sharpshooter or mergen, as we as I uh, explained earlier, a sniper of within the snipers, and another one as a machine gunner. Obviously, that's also shooting. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the word arrow and bullet is the same word in Kazakh language. So the same. Imagine if you said uh, machine gun is shooting arrows. That's kind of what we say in Kazakh, how we say it in Kazakh. It's the same word, ok. So uh, in that respect, we can say that both of these women uh, were shooting ok, which is arrow, <laughs> another meaning of it. And, you know, uh, great respect. They're heroes in Kazakhstan. There is a monument for them. 
and we praise them, we hold them in high regards. And that's, uh, that concludes the section about the usage of Kazakh horse bow and uh, practical horse bow, bow archery. And in the next section, we will move to making the Kazakh horse bow. So thank you. Stay with me. I'll see you soon.